CPTPP, China expressing interest. What would it mean for the trading, global trading system? And are you optimistic that CPTPP can get China more towards its trading practices? Sure. Well, as Linda, look, I remain very bullish on opportunities for trade and investment. I mean, we've seen over the past several years some significant deals done. Uh, we went through a period, uh, almost a golden era, where we had the TPP done or the CPTPP done. Um, but we've had since then, of course, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that's been put into place. Uh, we are continuing to see strong interest towards uh, from more countries in joining the CPTPP, including uh, you know, China, uh, economies like Taiwan, as well as countries like uh, the UK and, and Korea, as you mentioned. So I think it does underscore a recognition by a number of countries that these trade agreements help to facilitate trade flows, obviously. They help to facilitate investment flows. And those are going to be critical right. drivers of economic growth in the years ahead. Would China's membership make it even more imperative for the U.S. to be part of TPTPP, bearing in mind that it was initially thought about because it was supposed to counter China's influence? Well, you know, I remember when I was first uh, in negotiations around this, Mike Froman, who at the time was the U.S. trade representative for the United States, uh, he was really driving this agenda. And I must confess, for me, uh, seeing the United States walk away was a great loss. It would be great to have the United States come back. Um, obviously, China, if they felt that uh, they could meet the standards, the very high standards that are contained in the CPTPP, uh, would be a welcome addition given the significant impact of the Chinese economy. Uh, if we were able to achieve both countries, uh, both China and the United States, joining the TPP, then it truly would become the precursor for what we hope and what ultimately is the goal of having an APEC-wide trade block in place. Um, that's always been the long-term goal. It remains elusive, but being able to bolster the membership of the CPTPP would be a very significant step in the right direction. What remains elusive as well is the easing of supply chain disruptions. That's a huge headache uh, for countries around the world. How long do you think this will persist? Will it continue through 2022? Well, we're seeing a lot of commentary that suggests exactly that. I mean, certainly all the early indications are that we're going to continue to see constraints or crimps on that supply chain. Um, we already know that the impact of this will be felt throughout the uh, holiday period over December and January. And certainly the forecasts continue to see that we can expect there to be ongoing supply chain issues uh, leading into next year. But, you know, the, the opportunity that flows from this as well has Linda, of course, is the way in which countries in the market more generally are responding. Uh, we're continuing to see a diversification of supply chain. We're continuing to see a shift away from, um, you know, last minute supply chain services. And so I think we're going to get a effectively those two features coming together where you're getting diversification as well as that supply chain problem being fixed over the next six to 12 months. Uh, and that's going to lead to some interesting outcomes as well. Steve, can you just give me a sense of, you know, how can you have a trade block, a CPTP, uh, P, uh, when you've got yourselves, Australia and China, uh, when China's actually not at the moment uh, accepting quite a lot of your products? Sure. Well, I mean, that's why you need to have the rules of the road. That's why bodies like the, you know, the WTO are critical for resolving trade disputes. Clearly, you want uh, good actors on any side of a trade deal at all times. But from time to time, you do have disagreements that arise. Uh, where those disagreements arise, you need to have, um, you know, a body like the WTO and its appellate body in place. Now, the appellate body lost a lot of wind from its sails over the past several years uh, following some decisions that were taken by the United States. Reform was required. Reform is being discussed. And I think in time, reform will be implemented, the result of which will be a more agile WTO that responds to these types of trade disputes in a more timely way. And ultimately, that's going to be good for all economies concerned. But people quite often ignore the WTO. It's, it's toothless largely, isn't it, Steve? That's what I'm trying to get at. So, I mean, if you've got two actors who aren't getting on, how, how do you actually then cobble together, uh, you know, a, a trade block, if you will? Well, you know, Rich, you have similar comments that were made about the bilateral relationship between the United States and China as well. Um, and yet, notwithstanding some of those tensions, there are still agreements that were able to be forged and put in place. Uh, you know, there, there, there does remain a broad recognition that these trade deals 
are critical drivers of economic growth. They drive productivity, they provide more efficient allocation of capital across markets, and that ultimately is in the benefit, to the benefit of all countries concerned. So call me a glass half full kind of guy, but I fundamentally believe that countries know that these trade deals are in their economic interests, they're good for their people, they're good for driving prosperity, they're good for driving efficiency, and for that reason there always remains a desire and a willingness to work in a bona fide way to try to achieve good outcomes. Now sometimes that happens quickly, sometimes that takes longer, but the direction, the trend, uh, is a positive one. Uh, Steve, taking a look at tensions between uh, China and Australia, it does seem like Australia is already taking sides given the AUKUS deal. I'm just wondering, in the longer term, do you see Australia losing out? We're already seeing indications from China that it's buying more LNG from, from the U.S. It's also buying more uh, U.S. beef. Uh, Australia stands to lose. Well, you're seeing diversification on both sides, as Linda, both in terms of demand and supply. I mean, certainly uh, you are seeing some alternative input sources for China, but by the same token, you're seeing the Australian market diversify away uh, from having such a heavy reliance on China. And frankly, that was probably timely and worthwhile. Um, in fact, that was part of what drove the trade agenda, because no country wants to be... Uh, you know, have all of its eggs in one basket, so to speak. So that diversification happens on both sides of the equation. Uh, I come back to the fact, though, that when it comes to these types of trade deals, um, I remain optimistic that you can find pathways that work uh, for the countries concerned. And notwithstanding that there are tensions, uh, there still remains a lot of goodwill. There still remains opportunity to find common ground because that ultimately, you know, that, that interest, that, that self-interest, comes to the fore when it comes to countries making these types of deals. Tell me, Steve, can you have Taiwan and China in the same grouping? Uh, that may well lead to other tensions there as well. What, what's your take on that? Look, I think we'll, we'll need to see how that plays out. Ultimately, the geopolitical tensions that we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific region have been building for some time. Uh, they remain there. Uh, earlier, has Linda, you made the comment about Australia picking sides. I mean, I, I would just note that the consistent commentary that comes from uh, both Australia, the US, the UK, uh, as well as from ASEAN, as well as from China, is to make it clear that this isn't about picking sides. I don't think there are sides that need to be picked. Uh, what there is is a slightly different worldview. Uh, what there is, though, that is common is a strong commitment to multilateral institutions, and that includes multilateral institutions like the WTO. So I, I fundamentally think that there's enough goodwill uh, to be able to drive forward agreements. Now, whether that means Taiwan and, uh, and the China mainland are part of that, time will tell. Uh, but I think with all of these trade deals, the more economies that are involved, the more countries that are involved, the better it ultimately is for everyone.